Hi, this is Jonathan Jay, and on this video, we are going to discover the truth about business brokers. Now, if you haven't been on my free Zoom training, this is your opportunity. Somewhere on the screen, there is a link. Click on the link, it will open a page, and you can join my free Zoom training right now. But I want you to meet Rob Goddard, 20 years as a business broker. Let's discover what really happens behind the scenes. So Rob, how did it all start? <laughs> what, 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 can you remember the very first business that you sold? I can. And you do, don't you? It was up in uh, Mansfield. It was a tool hire and, and tool supplier business. And I'd already spent seven years working for someone else in an M&A brokerage business as general manager. Okay. But this one... One that we would know? Yes, they're still Possibly. trading. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Not as much as when I was in, in charge of it. Of course. But of course. <laughs> um, but I was working for someone else. I wasn't working for me. So that first guy, Tony, that gave me the order form to sell his business mm -hmm. as Rob Goddard not working representing mm -hmm. the company as, you, as your your new your yeah new when i was driving back down the m1 i couldn't stop the smile on my yeah, face sure. it was wonderful it's great because he yeah, trusted yeah. me yeah. with the sale of yeah. his treasured asset and the launch of your new business and yeah it was, it was validation that you could do this by yourself and i had shareholders in the background of my fledgling business okay. So the first thing I did was ring the main guy <laughs> yeah. and say, yeah, so good. I told you, I told you. Yeah, I and, and so you got the mandate to sell it. Got the mandate to sell it, and I sold it. And you sold it. <laughs> <laughs> Within eight months. I, I, um, which many, many brokers might be quite surprised that uh, yeah. not only did you get the mandate, but you sold it. And I think that's actually been a theme for you, I believe, in that your... your um, conversion if you like from 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 sales mandate to actually executing it and and selling it for the client is very very high isn't it i've i've always i've monitored it over the gracious must be 15 years now um of doing it myself three out of four typically is what it revolves around so selling three companies out of every four that come out and i know the ind and you know the industry average on 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 the sell side is about one in five yeah so i've managed to reverse those odds and what do you put that down to initially it was me because mm -hmm. i was a one-man band with yeah. some shareholders yeah but actually it was the team over because as it started to get some traction i couldn't do it all myself otherwise i'd end up in a funny farm you know i'd, I'd make myself ill so I started to build a team around me, initially with a couple of people that had worked for me before, because yeah. um, they were known quantities and there was no recruitment agency fee. Sure. <laughs> they, came, <laughs> they came across. Um, but actually, for many, many years, it's been the team. Yeah. And I've gradually learned to make myself redundant from the business mm -hmm. that I started and founded. Um, and that's carried forward into other things that I've done. So... A couple of other, I mean, yes, it's the team, which is a nice generic statement. A couple of things is not overvaluing businesses when you're a sell-side broker mm. or M&A advisory firms, as we like to call ourselves, <laughs> <laughs> disassociate ourselves with brokerage. It's, it's actually having an honest conversation with a seller about what their business is worth and actually what it isn't worth and why. And agreeing a number that's realistic that we want, we're seeking to beat. Yeah. Most people I've ever met in two decades or so of being in the M&A industry, the, the majority don't take that approach. They tell the prospective client who wants to sell the business what they want to hear, mm -hmm. overvalue the business. Mm -hmm. That client then has an inflated view and they ain't never coming down from that number. <laughs> No, no, no chance. No, because they've already started to spend My it. advisor told me. Absolutely. absolutely. <clears throat> you know, your salesman said, and I've never taken that approach myself when I went out in mm. business on my own. And that's one of the reasons why the conversion rate is so high and the team is good, talented people that can do it. Excellent. I mean, a, f a few years ago, I had, uh, I had a business that I wanted to sell. Mm. And I may well have approached someone that, uh, that you know. 
and the the figure being banded around was twenty million, which of course was it now? set my heart singing. <laughs> and twenty you million. Spe- sorry, how'd you spent it in your head? Um, yeah, of course, everyone does, right? And uh, I, I, 20, 20 million. And then the moment that contract was signed, yes. the number twenty was never mentioned ever again. It was it was like that number just didn't exist anymore. Funny, well, after you'd signed the contract absolutely, and, and started absolutely. to pay the retainer. Yeah, exactly. Mm. And of course, uh, I did sell it, uh, but it wasn't near, it wasn't anywhere near the 20. Well, on social media in recent years, I'm giving the naked truth to, mm-hmm. to people that want to listen and hear um, and expose this because I, I think it's an indictment against our industry that so many people, are, I would say, were not regulated yet sure <laughs> m a it's mis-selling because you're telling someone something that's not true really okay it could be worth well, well lots of things yeah. could happen it, but it's it's uh yes I, I suppose you could say that yeah a strategic buyer might place that value that there, there might be someone who comes along and is very very well funded more money than sense and and agrees to buy it for that amount, but that happens so rarely that it can't be presented as as the norm. So I've always worked with two numbers with my clients. One is the realistic price that me and the client agree mm-hmm. as a minimum walk away price. And if there's more than one shareholder to my client's business, then we agree that round the table. Yeah, and I document it not in the board minutes, but because <laughs> they may go across the other side at some point. Sure. Um, it's a minimal co price. We don't disclose it to the yes. other side, but we're all on the same platform. We're all on the same page. Then when we go out to market, the other thing that is, is called success, I've experienced, is competitive tension. The of same course. thing that you teach from the other perspective. Absolutely. You know, I'm seeing seven companies today, <laughs> you know, that I might be interested in buying one of them. It holds true on the other side of the fence. Mm-hmm. So competitive tension can drive up price, and I found by, on average, 134% difference between the lowest offer and the highest. But the highest bidder isn't necessarily the best bidder. Absolutely. It might be number two or number three because it's a better fit. Well, one of the uh, uh, the larger and better known private equity firms that is a, a spin-off of, uh, of a high street bank uh, is, is well known for overbidding in order to knock knock everyone else out out of the get exclusive the, the game get the exclusivity uh, and then they chip at chip at price all the way up to the day before completion <laughs> so you you end up with less than what you'd have got if you'd funny with someone else yeah that, that's just their strategy it's a tactic yeah and they wouldn't be the alone in that mm. yeah the, the the astute negotiators will do that so competitive tension having the right people and having a realistic price in mind before you go to market a key Yes, and that, but that message isn't out there sufficiently, which is why I'm spending. I spent years on LinkedIn, particularly getting that message out to the public, well, business owners. Yes. Um, yes, you want as much as possible. Yes, you want to use competitive attention. You want to have a choice, and it may not be the highest bidder. It might be the best. The the, the best bid may not be the best bidder. Mm-hmm. So there might be a good reason why you don't take the top bid. It, and if you're staying on as the seller for a period of time, two or three years, to look after your earn out, yeah. you've got to work with these people. You've got to like them, really. Yeah, Get on yeah, with yeah. them, because you're going to be in the same board meetings. Sorry for interrupting your video, but I wanted to introduce you to a great lawyer in the UK who can get your deals done for you. He's worked for 50 of my mastermind clients in the last few months alone. His name is John Andrews, and I've got his details right here in my little black book of contacts. You can phone him on 0345 241 2494, or you can email him on johnandrews.deallawyer at jmw.co.uk. If you want someone who can get a deal done, he is your guy. So let's get back to the video. So on my most recent exit, there were actually two parallel parties running in parallel. There was a um, a, a very well funded individual, yeah, and there was a a well known private equity firm, right? And the two deals were actually identical. They you you you, could, you couldn't right. you couldn't the tell them apart. Fact paper between but them. the individual was promising one extra thing that tipped it in his favour. Um, 
unfortunately it was a promise that didn't actually <laughs> come to fruition really uh, yeah <laughs> funny that um but but yeah having 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 two parties interested in in acquiring your business surely has to force the numbers in the right direction for you the seller just not yes the numbers hence 134 percent spread on offers but also it might not be the price that goes up too much it might be the terms yeah because that's the other half isn't it we you and i know that it when do you get that money on on what basis and what are the conditions and what's it contingent on so it might be it's a better deal it might be a lower figure company b but the deal structure is better for the seller interesting so actually if you're a buyer top tip for any buyers listening to this is to understand what the hot buttons are for the person that you're in front of, what matters to them most, and how can you construct your deal structure to play to what they're looking for? And I find a, a, a great question, because as you know, I'm, I've started on the buy side with the help of your fast, fast track, yes. five-day fast track courses. Um, opening question that I use is, what does great look like for you? You know, if uh-huh. we can reach a deal... What, what does that do for you? And I write it down because I want to make sure that their objectives are covered if I can. And if I can't fulfill that particular objective, I'll be honest enough and say, so, so I can't. Here's a, here's a question on that. So sure. I think probably most owners that are thinking of selling, when you ask them that question, I would guess that the first thing that they say is, a, is, a, is, is, is the money, is the number. But then when you you have a deeper conversation with them they come out with all these other things and some of them move up the list above the number and price actually is less important than speed certainty exit by a certain date what what's your opinion on that that is true but that's not how it plays out initially tell us it, 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 what you say is truth no because when i ask them what their magic number is they they go all coy mm-hmm. they don't give me a number I've met thousands of potential sellers over 20 odd years. They don't. They they have a little. They they go back in the seat and they laugh a bit. I said, No, no, I'm being serious. But they know, but they might not, <laughs> right? So so why well, aren't they telling you because, as soon as you ask? I found this. It took me years to discover mm-hmm. this because if they give me a number, they'll think that I'll work as the advisor of anything below that. Yeah, which actually is not true because when you're on three or five percent success fee you want to sell it for as much as possible as sure. a sell side broker but that's what they assume that if they give a price so we initially have that sort of dancing around handbags moment mm-hmm. and then i say to them, look I, I said magic number not value your business so forget about value your business mm-hmm, i'll do that mm-hmm. in a moment because i've had your three years accounts and your management accounts in front of me what is the capital sum that you need in which to move on in life you know, finish one chapter, start a new one. Mm-hmm. What, what is that number? I won't find it in the P&L, and I won't find it in the balance sheet. It's here, and probably here as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Then we have an honest conversation about ideally what they're looking for. And then I give them a reality check. If, if, if they're wanting double or treble, what I think is a good price, I'll tell them, I don't think I can get that. And I know some of those people have gone to a competitor, broker. Who's told them that they can get it. For sure. Because they, they, they've got their targets to hit that month. <laughs> yeah, well, ex- yeah. And, there, and there was someone on the phone just the other day asking for a business just like yours. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Sounds familiar, doesn't it, <laughs> yeah. with the estate agent industry? Yes. A year later, though, because I diarise this, a yeah. year later, I'll give them a call. Yeah, sure. The majority, can't remember what the percentage is, the majority have not sold. No. And they're nowhere near selling, many of them. Yeah. They've had some interest, in fairness... But nowhere near the price, funny enough, nowhere near the price that the salesman quoted a year ago. <clears throat> and then I say, well, are you disillusioned with the people you're with at the moment? And um, often they are. They still want to sell. So I said, well, what's your exit terms then with the broker? Is there some sort of clawback clause? You know, what are you commi- What did you sign a year ago? Mm. And of course, they can never remember. No, they probably didn't read it either. No. They were so keen to sell. 
Yeah, and, and clause and one three seven point yeah, B. Yeah, yeah. In, 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 in point Font, six. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, says there's a two year clawback. So I, 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 I've often wondered whether um, someone with poor eyesight could use that as a defence <laughs> about not understanding a contract that they signed. They couldn't. Yes, they couldn't yes, actually read. Yeah. They couldn't actually read the contract. Visually impaired. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think business impaired. <laughs> um, so there's a com- and I say, well, there's a conversation you've got to have with your existing people, because mm-hmm. um, often there's a clawback that if you terminate your contract with that advisor, yeah. if you sell it within a period, a year or two, then you've got to pay a success yeah, fee because they they expect someone who's going to who's going to cancel it may well have found a buyer elsewhere and is trying to get out of paying the. And the do you fee. know what some sellers do? That they try and yeah. cut out the broker that yeah. brought all the people to the table. So I can see what's in there. Mm-hmm. But uses the conversation to be had, um, and then the person, the seller that I'm speaking to, says, "What? Well, okay, I pay them the success fee if you go ahead and sell it, Rob. Well, I work for nothing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, well, I've already spent money with the other company. I said, yeah, it's the cost of <laughs> the cost of getting it wrong. <laughs> Yes. Um, so I've n- I've never done a deal on fees. I've just said, look, it's it's going to cost you more because you made a mistake. But that's why we all make mistakes in life. You know, it's it's a learning. Take it as a training course. I tell them. So <laughs> earlier on, you mentioned that terms are, are as important as, as yes price. on a deal structure. So yeah. in 2017, I sold a business to a trade buyer, and they actually offered me two options. One had a larger initial consideration, and then a, a, a smaller amount of deferred, and the deferred was linked to revenue of yeah. the of the business for the next three years, yeah. and the other was was smaller initial and then a higher deferred. I actually went for the smaller initial. I went for I went for less less money up front because I, I didn't have a sort of an urgent requirement for cash, but I believed in the business that I was selling. And I was I was willing to back it with those beliefs, uh, and you know, I'll never know whether I came out on top because there was no way of knowing what would yeah. happen otherwise. But, um, but yeah, so 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 those terms uh, aren't always. I mean, ev- every buyer believes every seller is after as much money up front as possible, but Indeed. not in every case. Exactly, it's not always about the money; it's about other things. It's quite hard to find those out. Because they're, they're having to make themselves vulnerable to the other side. Yeah. But you've got to do that in business, I think, because you never make progress. And what you've just – your tactic or your, your strategy, rather, is spot on. And that's how I've trained exit clients. Always an offer has to have two. And it's, I learned that donkey's years ago in sales training. It's a good negotiation tactic. You've got A, B. Mm-hmm. That's an alternative close. Absolutely. They've got to make a decision. Yeah, rather than you what take, you haven't take got is, I'll think about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, if you're making two offers, then um, that's that. That's what we. That's what we've encouraged all buyers to do. So, I, but we have to train the exit clients in a meet before a meeting. To say, look, they're likely to make an offer. We want them to make two two offers. One is cash up front, pretty much with very little lead it's a clean deal mm-hmm, mm-hmm. or there's one which is a bigger of a bigger number but you've got to wait a period of time and it'll be contingent on something Cl- exit clients like that go think okay so it gives me a bit of choice so not only you're getting eight people around the table wanting to buy your business most of them like four four out of eight will make an offer and of those four offers there's two offers on each yeah, offer letter yeah, that's good so I, I think giving choice, and you're right, it isn't all about the top number. Yes, it's important, but it ain't the only thing. It's funny because years ago, I used to do that on the dealmakers courses. I was, used Did to, you? That was my part. <laughs> I, I remember it very clearly. I remember the slide where it was about make, make, putting together two offers. And, and, and I haven't actually included that in the course in, in recent years. And maybe right. I, need to, I need to bring that back Definitely. in. Definitely. I've yeah. forgotten what a good strategy that is. It is be- because you, you you're channeling the person in front of you down either route that you're comfortable with. Yes. What you're not giving them is I'll think about it. Option. Yes. There's no option C. <laughs> yeah. So so let's talk about um, brokers and in in, ge- in general. Um, and 
I have come under some considerable uh, attack from some quarters, uh, especially on social media, um, by people who don't like uh, my line from you know, go, going back several years of don't go to brokers to, to buy a business. And of course, you know, brokers might feel that that would somehow damage their, their business. Um, where in actual fact, uh, the, 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 the more specific version is don't go to brokers for your first deal if you are a new business buyer once you've bought a business your credibility goes up and you know you you you, you have more confidence to negotiate with a professional already. yes yeah yeah uh, so yeah you know, i i i would imagine that in the past your heart would sink if if someone came to you and said i've never bought a business before i've got very limited resources what have you got for sale yeah um, I, but I can smell them at fifty paces. It usually come via LinkedIn. It's an in mail, okay, <laughs> or or an email. So um, I I know what to look for, and they're wasting their time because, particularly with mine and our methodology, is to look for a number of potential interested parties. Mm -hmm. If you've n not done a deal, you haven't got your own cash that you can do proof of fundings with bank statement. That's a tough uphill battle yeah, you're, for that you're, individual. You're an unknown quantity. Unknown quantity, and there'll be others out there, strategic purchasers that have got a trading business with yes. a P&O and a balance sheet. So it's uphill battle. There are some things that are giveaways, right, because they don't say I haven't got any money <laughs> or I'm going to use other people's money and I haven't I only set up the business a week ago on company's house. They usually want any... The, the giveaways to me is any sector, any amount. <laughs> oh, right. So, so, so they, they want to buy a business. They don't really know what they want yeah. to buy. Right. But serious okay. investors okay. don't do that. Serious yeah. investors usually buy something that they know. Yes. And got experience in. Yes. Um, they also have a, a long list of criteria, things mm -hmm. that they're looking for, things that they're not looking for. They normally have Geog a band, geography, geography, size. Yeah, so it isn't anything from 50,000 to 50 million. It, it doesn't work like that with investors. Yeah. So those things are big giveaway on a LinkedIn DM. And, yes. and I've stopped responding to those. Yeah, because it, the, 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 the conversation's so broad, yeah, it's not your job to help them narrow down their focus uh, to so get focused. deciding what they want to buy. Yeah, it, it doesn't matter if you t give three or four industry sectors you're looking to buy into. Mm -hmm. Have a narrow band. It won't be 50,000 to heart. You know, half a billion. It won't be. <laughs> is it fifty thousand or is it half a billion? Come on. Um, so yeah, I, I, I've always trained my people in twenty years um, to smug those out because that it, it wastes everyone's time. So, so we have a yeah. consistent message. You're saying to people on your first transaction, don't waste, don't go to the brokers, don't waste their time. No, because you've got you've got nothing, you've got nothing to to show for it yet. No, but if you've done your first deal. And therefore, you're going to be a lot clearer on your what you want. You probably want yeah. something similar to the business you just bought, exactly. but a bit bigger. And you might be able to borrow off the back of that first business. Uh, exactly, <laughs> exactly right. Which is why which borrowing is why your own money. Your first acquisition should always be a solid, profitable business. Should the be. last thing you want to do is a turnaround. <laughs> we'll talk about this uh, later. on another video. On maybe. another, <laughs> another one. Um, is, a, is a turnaround or or a, or a business that's distressed because even though you might be able to buy it for nothing you'll be put you'll be putting money in at some point so buying a good solid profitable business on day one allows you to not only reap the benefits of the cash flow but also leverage against that cash flow that business is trading history exactly business now two. now from a broker's perspective you're a serious contender absolutely you're um, in the industry already I, I understand the temptation for the newbie buyer because you see all these businesses for sale, and you think, "Oh, right, it looks it looks and so I, easy." I know, having gone on your five, five day fast track, I know you specifically say more than once, <laughs> "Don't go for the brokers," because our interests aren't aligned. We want no. to sell for as much as possible with as much cash on day one. Yeah, with, with the less friction as possible. You don't want people going out and raising money. You you, you want someone who can who can yeah. just do a transfer, pass yeah. the things across the table, yeah. and the deal's done. Yeah. So I. I I understand why most of them try and go for the quick win because the alternative is hard work. And I know, again, you, you don't make any, you don't hide the fact it is hard work. 
deal flow is, is critical. Yeah. And, that's and, you a lot. Ju- and you can't just do it once. You've got to do it consistently. <laughs> and, but, but, I have, but I have people on Mastermind who, who, even though they've done that part of the training, the deal flow yeah. training, they still go off. They say, well, it's all very well what Jonathan said, but there's got to be a faster, easier way. <laughs> and they go and phone a few brokers. And then three, three or four months later, they've kind of figured it out. That in actual fact, that first deal should have been done the way I know the, and, the way I describe. And, and, and majority of brokers are useless. I know this because I'm in buying mode, and we talk about it on another yeah. occasion. I signed an NDA on a business for sale, motorcycle repair business, because I love bike. I, I'm petrol okay. head, and I love motorcycles. That's why I'm interested. Um, signed the NDA last Wednesday. No response by Friday. I didn't have. It, it's a business that's under some pressure. It's distressed. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know how to stress because they haven't sent me any. So when you say last info. Wednesday, today's Monday. So oh, uh, sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. So five days later, I, I over the, yesterday I looked up who the two owners of the um, insolvency practitioner or the the two main party partners, yeah. and I did a DM <laughs> on both. Of them. I sent right. the messages. Right. So I've been waiting. You've got a complete. You've got you want offers in by next so, Friday. So, so it's it's uh, with. An IP already, is it? Yeah, but they've, they've got an advisor working for them, hence yeah. the sort of broker thing. But it, it, I, this is frustrating because I, I would make an offer. And I put in my DM yesterday, I'm looking to make an offer on Monday, i.e. today. Yeah. But you've not given me access to the data room or any info. So how can I make an offer? Well, we know probably what's going on there. <laughs> Do we? Yes. <laughs> the deal's already been yeah. done. <laughs> but, I, but I know this to be true when you're dealing direct with brokers. Yeah. That they're useless at getting yeah, oh, some of them. Are useless yeah. at getting the NDA out, uh, getting the IM out to you, mm. the information memoranda after you sign the NDA. So you do wonder: do they are they serious about selling their clients' business? Well, maybe it just feels like a lot of hard work compared <laughs> to getting the instruction. <laughs> getting the instruction is easy; you mm. get paid up front, and then actually having to deliver on that. Yeah, maybe that. Uh, I mean, there are exceptions. So, so there are some so, exceptions. Yeah. Um, in in the last few years, I've um, uh, done quite a few deals with. With brokers, yeah, they've come to us at some at one point. They'll come to us several times a day. So we've got this one, got this one. This this buyer dropped out. Are you interested? And that was sort of the circumstances of the of the pandemic yeah. era. And and we we did a lot uh, with with brokers. And there was one particular uh, firm in the northwest who I thought was incredibly professional and you know really, uh, and they did they did work hard and, and they did and they did their bit. They're in the minority. Yeah. I know um, with people that have worked for me over the last 20 years, I've always trained them. You get that IM out the same day we've got the signed NDA. Exactly. Because every day the buyer could be getting colder is mm-hmm. how I train my troops. Every day. Yeah, their interest respond. level isn't going up. Their interest no. level is probably going to go down. <laughs> it's only yes. going one way. Absolutely. So, and also it's good news because you want to go back to your client who's selling saying we've had interest from. We've got yes. the sign in the and sending out the IM. It's good news for the client who's forking out several thousand pounds a month yeah. to you in a retainer. Keeps them at the table. But, yeah. So, well, fortunately, most of the market doesn't work that way, which is good news when you're in the minority because you've got a USP and a differentiator. Yeah, no, no ab- ab- absolutely. So so my sort of hard line against uh, against brokers is, um, is, is softened slightly when people understand the full... <laughs> The full significance of what I'm saying, yeah, not great for your first deal if you've got nothing no. to show for it. Uh, but once you've done one deal, you're actually in the market, in the sector. You're an owner of that type of business, and you're looking for a bolt on. Exactly. Completely different conversation, isn't it? It completely different. In fact, you get the red carpet treatment, or should do, from the advice, the sell side advice. Yeah, because because you you someone in that position has proven that they can follow through in a deal and execute it and actually get the deal done and over the line. Um, a lot of people can do the earlier stages, but actually getting it over the line is a is a is a different matter. And then they're coming to you saying, "I want another one like this." Yep. Well, you've you you suddenly moved up into the top top levels of inquiries that week, I guess. Yeah, and it's and it's congruent with the sell side message, or should be that one on one can equal three if you've got the right buyer in front of you, potential mm-hmm. buyer in front of you, and you would be if you've got a trading business that's similar and synergistic. Yeah. Then one on one could equal three yeah. from the seller's perspective. Could be a good buy for you as the acquirer. So it could work for both. There's always two multiples. I've always taught this. There's two multiples on any deal. There's the seller's multiple and the buyer's multiple. Mm-hmm. They're often not the same number. No. 
the clever advisors work out where that mid ground is that works with both parties, and you have to be quite creative in the deal structure to do that. Mm -hmm. um, which is why some of them, some of the brokers can't doesn't compute. Yeah, they're yeah. looking to stick it on a billboard, wait for the phone to ring. Yes, and then try and send out some info and, and hopefully collect the success fee in a few months' time so <laughs> once nice, the business uh, has been sold. A nice, a nice bonus. So, mm. so for, for people listening who've got a business, how do they maximise their exit value? Ideally, think about the exit before you've bought a business and sunk any time and money into it. I would say the, best, the best time to think about your exit is before you've bought one. Mm -hmm. Then you've got a long-term plan, whether it's three years, five years, ten years, whatever it is. Most people aren't Warren Buffett. It rarely sells. Um, think about your long-term plan, about your exit and your exit price, and, and which year you're looking to do that. Um, then have a growth plan as to how you're going to achieve that as a seller. Mm -hmm. um, the vast majority of business owners out there probably listening to this don't have a growth plan. It's in, It's there. And I, I said, well, I can't chop your head off when you're in front of buyers. <laughs> yeah, we're going to need to demonstrate because you're talking about the future potential, mm. the value, because you want, you know, you want a 10 times multiple. But you've got to be able to communicate the narrative that substantiates a high multiple. And it's not just the growth plan. It's having the people in place to implement yes. the growth plan that does yeah. not depend upon you, the exiting seller, as much as you are very generously offering to stay for a handover period, have generous offers <laughs> to, uh, to, to hand, over, hand over the business that you're taking all this money for. Yeah, it's yeah. Got, it, the business has to stand on its own two feet and implement the plan with existing team members. Rather yeah, it doesn't than, involve them. It doesn't involve them. You can't, you can't say to the, to the buyer, well, if you go and hire all these people, they can do it. Yeah. So get your exit plan, get your magic number set. Yeah. Then make yourself redundant from your own business by building the team that run it day to day. Hey, looks as an owner, why are you working full time mm. in your own business? Employ people that are better than you. There you go. That's a, there's a thing for the ego as an owner. There are people out there better than us. We've just got to attract that talent and retain them. Um, the other thing with getting a top price is going out to a market. So I know it's the reverse message, the one that mm -hmm. uh, you give to your candidate, your students. But it's different rules. You do want choice. Like if you're buying businesses, you want a choice. You're not just going to find one company that you might want to buy. You're going to look for a variety because they may be a total time waster, that seller. Yes. So you need a deal flow. So it's the same on the other side of the fence. Um, but I, I think the key thing is to make sure that you're, you've made yourself redundant because most owner managers are unemployable. I am. I know you are. <laughs> we are. Yeah. I, I always find it remarkable, though, that when, when someone says to me they've found a business to buy and the, the owner wants to stay on for a number of years, because sh sh shifting or switching from being the owner who who calls the shots to someone who's being told what to do, I mean, that's a, that's a massive... Oh. I don't see how that works. Is, is, that, is that the seller naively thinking that the buyer will fall for it and feel comfort that the seller will stay on and, and therefore the deal is m more likely to be done? I, I think that's, that is true. I, I have a lovely theatrical piece I do with new clients when we, go, when we touch on this about stay on periods. They, they say, oh, a handover period. Mm -hmm. I say, what, three years, four years, five years handing over? No. Uh, I, I thought months. Mm months but you haven't documented anything processes in your business yeah, you sure. are at the center of your universe so then they usually come to well i'm willing to stay on for a year or two if it helps the buyer mm -hmm. it helps me get the bigger price i said well it could do but actually what they're thinking is you could be a lightning rod for dissatisfaction because mm -hmm. a lot of successful entrepreneurs are um a very certain personality type <laughs> they are full of their own self-confidence they're used to doing it their way. And I paint this picture with new clients and say, how would you feel you've sold your business and you've got an earn out? Your new, uh, your new boss, because you're going to have a boss now. You haven't had a boss for 30 years, uh, Gavin. How are you going to feel when they say, do it my way or get out? 
And I, I do the... I do, <laughs> you point the I, finger at them. I do, yeah. and get out. Yeah. I mean, that's even worse. And they've never thought about that. Yeah, sure. Because you're right, absolutely right. They're used to calling the shots, and now they're just going to be an average Joe as an employee. And part of the... Um, consideration for the sale of their business is contingent on hitting targets they could be leaving a lot of cash maybe millions on the table by walking out because some of them take umbrage yeah. so i i normally encourage clients unless they're really nice people <laughs> so i i had a uh, a handover period it was yeah. like it was a consultancy agreement i was being paid a day rate yeah. i think it was up to a maximum of 20 days um, and I only lasted nine days, <laughs> and the, that long. the new owner's <laughs> CEO got rid of me. And I, I thought then there's an interesting strategy here where you become as irritating as possible, so helpful, <laughs> so incredibly helpful, that they just had enough of you and they want to get rid of you quickly. And I was very happy to forego like 11 days of consultancy fees because I, I wanted to yeah. do So for, a, for a seller, the only number that matters is the cash on completion. Absolutely. For a seller. Yeah. So if that... So I, that's when I work with clients. I say, look, what's your magic number? It, it, if it's the cash on completion, anything that we might get via an earn out or deferred consideration is icing on the cake, mm -hmm. isn't it, Gareth? Yes, yes. Um, and we we get we get that buy in. Um, yeah, but the only matter the only number that matters is what they're getting on day one because the rest of it is up in the air. And Absolutely. I, I've some minority of business owners can work for someone else some not the majority yeah and so we want a shorter deal we want a shorter tail really even if the overall number isn't as high um a cleaner deal usually works for most sellers mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. they can't work for anyone else yes. even as a retained consultant <laughs> which is a, a, a common way that don't work because in fact it's even easier because there's no employment <laughs> Well, in, in terms Re of terminating. Terminating. If they're a consultant, they're a self-employed. Yeah. Be terminated. Yeah, you're not being any, retained any, any as recourse, an employee. Whatsoever. So, yeah. you know, you're dispensable like any other supplier. Maybe kind of what I teach people on the <laughs> buy side. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I, 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 that's how we, the mindset that we encourage before we get in a room with a potential buyer is we've, that's why acquirers private equity vcs like working with my company that um that i've had over these because we've already done a lot of hard work with the seller mm -hmm. we've dispelled a few myths we've got a bit of a reality check yes we do want to get as much as possible but we're not wasting the other side's time yeah so it's, got, it's getting a, a sensible balance yes so, so so rob how do people get in touch with you uh linkedin is the best way Okay. Um, but please don't pitch to me. <laughs> you know, when you get a, a DM connection request. Sure. Or, um, but I, I'm really, I, I connect with anyone as long as I'm not being pitched to within a nanosecond of connecting. Yeah, that's not such a good feeling, is it? Yeah. Um, I put out, like you, I put out quite a bit of content, video content on LinkedIn. Um, I want to get the word out there for free <laughs> sure. to anyone that wants to listen. So LinkedIn is perfect. Okay. If it's someone that's looking to sell their business and it's urgent, then they'll find my phone number on the LinkedIn profile. Fantastic. Or they can ping me an email. Rob, amazing advice. Very interesting to listen to you. You've been incredibly Pleasure. helpful and we must get you back for another <laughs> episode soon. That's it. How can I say no? <laughs> <laughs>